It's good to see you guys again. The title of our lesson this morning is Belief That Leads to Salvation. Belief That Leads to Salvation. Uh, one of the things that my wife Betty likes to do uh, is listen to scary stories on YouTube. Sometimes they're made up scary stories and sometimes she'll say, I had to stop listening to them because I was, I was getting a little scared. Um, but recently she wanted me to listen to one she heard because uh, it was actually a true story that happened. And it was uh, a story of a freak accident and a disaster that happened back in the, the 70s. Uh, and I would like to use this story this morning as an illustration to kind of lead us into our discussion on belief that leads to salvation. And I, th I think that you'll see where we go with this as we go along. So pay attention to the story you know, because we're going to keep referencing back to this. So here is a written description of what happened. On May 28th, 1977, uh, around 9 p.m., a fire began at the Beverly Hills Supper Club just outside of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Despite plenty of warning that a fire had started, many of the 3,000 guests within the building complex were unable to evac evacuate in time. The fire ultimately claimed 165 lives before the night was over. The building was constructed in 1937 and was a massive establishment for dinner and entertainment venues. And this was really before all the safety protocol uh, was out out and about with uh, with the government. But the venue had become so popular that its construction was expanded in the early 1970s so it could fit even more people. Uh, the extensive complex consisted of multiple stages, dining halls, and event rooms. And it just sounds like it was a huge place. However, the historic building had no sprinkler systems, no smoke detectors, and some of the innermost event spaces had no exits leading directly to the outside. Uh, you had to go through different rooms to get there. Um, so on the night of the fire, uh, it was the, the, the cabaret room, it was called, which had a safety limit of 600 people, was filled that night beyond capacity with 1,300 people. So uh, this was before they had the limits. I think, you know, that's why they have limits now. So they crammed 700 extra people into this large room in the aisles and around the perimeter of the room so they could hear the performance on stage. While the majority of the guests were unaware, a fire began growing out of control from one of the outer rooms of the complex and it began, began making its way inward. And so seeing as how there was no alarm system that they could pull or hit, the workers of the complex had to run from room to room telling everybody who was in the complex, get out, there's a fire. And uh, it was around 9.06 p.m. when busboy Walter Bailey arrived at the cabaret room with 1,300 people in it. He was frustrated when the supervisors of the room hesitated to sound the warning not wanting to interrupt the act up on stage. They saw no smoke or flames. And you know, when Walter Bailey told them of the fire, they probably just imagined, you know, that's some kitchen fire out back, they'll take care of it, we're okay. Uh, they saw no reason to evacuate a room full of excited and more importantly, paying customers. They probably thought it was going to be something where, oh, we have to go outside and, and then they'll let us come back in, you know, boring. So faced with a hard decision, which uh, could potentially get the busboy fired, Walter Bailey took it upon himself. He rushed up on stage and interrupted the performer by grabbing his microphone. And he calmly told everyone, there's a fire, you need to evacuate the building right now, promptly. There were 1,300 people in the cabaret room at that moment. If every single person had instantly and calmly stood up and heeded Walter's warning, they may have all been able to evacuate the room in time. However, most of them did not believe that the busboy's warning was as urgent as it seemed. Out of the whole group, only a few hundred actually got up and started moving toward the exits. The rest remained. 
Uh, they saw no smoke or flames, and they felt safe where they were. They had paid a lot of money for their tickets, and they didn't really wish for their evening to be disrupted. So over 1,000 people remained in their seats. Only four minutes later, after the warning given by the busboy, at 9.10 p.m., power went out in the whole complex. And it was a scary situation. It plunged every room and corridor into pitch black. At almost the same moment, the smell of uh, smoke and burning had reached the cabaret room. And that's when they knew, oh, this was serious. Uh, the masses began to panic. Leaping to their feet, they pushed and shoved, stumbling in the darkness, trying to reach the door. And they began trampling one another. And that's probably what led to more deaths than anything. Uh, the exits to the room quickly became jammed with a cluster of bodies trying to get out. The situation only worsened when flames raced through the building and blocked two of the three exits leading out of the cabaret room. So now there were about a thousand people who were trying to escape through just one set of double doors. So they were trapped. Uh, reports from firefighters and survivors later described people stacked up, they said like cordwood, and I take that as like a stack of firewood, in the doorways. One on top of the other, those on top crushing those beneath. Uh, despite people, her, uh, desperate people hurled themselves against this crowd again and again uh, on this mound of people trying to escape, stumbling over bodies, bodies both dead and alive. In the end, about 2,800 guests of the 3,000 in the complex were able to evacuate. However, 165 people did not make it out alive that night. Uh, so some died from the fire itself, while most of them died from smoke inhalation and suffocation from being crushed. So that, is, that was an interesting story when I heard it, when Betty showed me. And I said, well, I think there's a good lesson uh, there to, to be learned. So the reason I tell you this story today is to illustrate a very important biblical principle that belief is what leads to salvation. Belief that leads to salvation. Uh, you know, I, I want you to think for a moment about that brave young man who stood up and sounded the warning uh, to 1,300 people. It was said that Walter Bailey, who was 18 years old, and this was probably his little side job, uh, it was an individual who suffered from severe stage fright. Yeah, so jumping up on stage and looking like a fool to over a thousand people was no easy task. And he probably did look pretty silly at the time. Uh, as we mentioned before, if the entire group would have calmly gotten up and walked out to the exits, they would have had four full minutes before the lights all went out and it was too late. That's a long time when it's a life or death situation. But uh, because the masses did not see the danger with their own eyes and they didn't believe the messenger, or at least they weren't convinced of the severity or the urgency of the matter, 165 precious souls ended up dying that night. So those in the audience who believed the warning lived. Those who did not believe the warning they rolled the dice on if they got out alive or not. So I think that's an interesting illustration. When the Bible talks about the importance and the necessity of mankind, quote unquote, believing in Jesus, you see that phrase in Scripture a lot. When we're told to believe in Jesus, I want you to understand it is the exact same concept as those who needed to believe in the busboy's warning that night who took the initiative to escape because they believed him. Okay, Belief that leads to action is what saves. Trusting that there is something that we need to do if we wish to be saved. So in comparison, Jesus is the messenger, right? Standing up before the masses, sounding the alarm to everyone, and really unconcerned if he looks foolish to the world right now. Jesus doesn't care. Because he knows his message is true, that there is a real danger, and that people are in big trouble. And he warns them about the fires of hell, tells them how to get to heaven. So in a world full of souls who are in danger, Scripture says, like our illustration, there are three different groups of people in this world based on how they respond to the warning 
given by the messenger who is Jesus Christ. Number one, I want you to consider with this comparison, there are the believers. The believers. Acts chapter 5 and verse 14 says about the gospel, it says, And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So this group, uh, in comparison to our illustration, represents all those who believed the messenger's warnings and followed the path to safety. Right, so those who made it out of the fire that night were the ones who believed and moved out like they were supposed to. So similarly, when one is called a believer, you see that phrase in the New Testament, uh, it means that they heard the message of safety, they trusted it, they believed it, but it also implies that they followed it. Okay, Action is implied here. It is not simply belief alone, that little mental assertion in your heart. Scripture only categorizes one as a true believer after they follow the path to safety. Right? For example, in Acts chapter 16 with uh, the Philippian jailer, after the jailer had heard the gospel and he followed it with all of his household and they responded in baptism, right? Uh, verse 34 of that chapter says, Now when they had brought them into the house, right, they had just obeyed the gospel, he set food before them, and the verse says, And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Right? So notice, he was only called a believer after the fact. It was said, oh, now these can be categorized as the believers because they followed the path to safety. So a true believer is one who believes enough to follow the steps and to follow uh, action, just like our story. Point number two, there are, of course, the non-believers. Acts chapter 28 and verse 24 says, uh, And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. So when the message of safety was proclaimed, not everyone thought it was valid. Right? Not everyone trusts in the warning. Not everyone thinks it's true. Right? So the group who disbelieves the warning will by no means follow the warning. So you must believe before you can even obey. Therefore, they uh, disqualify themselves from the possibility of being saved when they choose not to believe the path to safety. That's why when Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, if you believe and are baptized, you'll be saved. But if you don't believe, you'll be condemned. Someone says, well, you didn't say nothing about baptized, but well, why not? Because no one is going to follow the steps to safety if they don't first believe the steps to safety. So he says, just if you don't believe, you'll be condemned. Romans 16, or Romans chapter 10 and verse 16 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Well, why not? The verse says, essentially, because not everyone believed it. Not everyone believes it. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So you see, they didn't obey because they didn't believe the message. And that's what happened at that supper club, the Beverly Hills place that night. Uh, the crowd did not evacuate because they didn't believe the warning. Uh, so those who believed naturally are those who will obey. So point number three, or group number three, I want you to consider a third group who is perhaps the saddest group of the three. There are those who believe, but not enough to take action. They believe, but they don't take action. You know, so for whatever reason, uh, following the path to, for, to safety just never happens for this group. You know, there would have been probably several people in the crowd that night who heard Walter Bailey's cry for safety, who believed his report, but perhaps they just didn't believe it enough. They weren't convinced fully to take action. You know, perhaps a panicked wife stared at her husband and said, Honey, we need to get out of here. Did you hear what he said? Only to be met with a reassurance from her husband that said, Well, let's just hang tight for a little bit, see what happens. Okay. I think everything will be all right. Maybe others said, I, I, I think I believe what, what this young man is saying, but I'm just going to wait and I'm going to see what everybody else does. You know, if everybody else gets up and leaves, then I'll go. But, you know, I don't really want to be uh, the only ones getting up and leaving my chair, and then I got to come back and all that. So, you know, is there spiritual application there? I think absolutely. 
you know, if, you know, you, you say this, I'll follow the crowd's response to the warning. I'll follow the majority. How about that? Because certainly the majority will lead to the right decision. Is that correct? No. Right? The decision of the multitude is not always going to lead to the actual path of safety. A lot of times the panic sets in and people don't choose what's right and they don't take the right path. And that's really where some people are spiritually when it comes to obeying the gospel. They say, I would do it. I, I'm close. I, I think it's true, but you know, I, you, I look around me. So many people aren't following it. And they convince themselves and they say, I, I, just, I can't possibly follow a narrow path if everyone else isn't doing it. But you know, the lesson here today is we've got to take it upon ourselves to heed the warning at all costs. Right? Whether there are two people who take the path to safety or 2,000, it really shouldn't matter to you. Because there is, if there's safety on the, at the end of that road, you need to take it. Right, regardless of what anyone thinks, regardless of being among, among the few who take it, because you need to believe the warning and take action. That's how you're going to get to heaven. That's how you're going to heed the warning. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 42 is a great example of individuals who believed Jesus in his warning. They believed he was who he said he was, but they wouldn't take action. It says, nevertheless, this is John 12, 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. All right, so here are men in the first century who say to themselves, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to believe that this Jesus guy is the real deal. And, but you know, I, I'm, I'm just, I can't do it. I can't confess him and do what I need to do. Because I'll look silly in front of the crowd. I don't want to be among the few who call out to Jesus because there will be others in the crowd who think I look silly for doing it. What a foolish mentality. Gambling with your soul. Because you know, once the fire comes in the end, and by that I'm referencing the fires of hell, once the fire comes and you're safe from the fire and they're not, Who's going to look like the smart one in the end? Those who believed and acted on the warning are going to be saved, regardless of what others thought. That's what important. That's what is important. Don't do not be like King Agrippa in Acts chapter twenty-six and verse twenty-eight. Agrippa heard Paul's warning through Jesus Christ. What did he say? The famous line: "You almost persuade me to become a Christian." Almost. Well, that doesn't do you much good, does it? We reference Noah's Ark and the flood of that time. What about those who almost listened to Noah? I almost got on the Ark. I was close. I, I, I kind of believed him, but no one else was following Noah. So I didn't. Almost isn't good enough. You, know, you can imagine in our story... Uh, who those who almost heeded the warning. Imagine being there and you almost heeded the warning. Flames finally start flowing into the room and you're convinced, oh, there is a problem. And you say to yourself, I almost got up when he told me to get up. And I almost left. But now I'm here in the pitch black. I can't breathe. And now I'm going to probably die. So do not almost heed the warning. Right? Take it upon yourself to follow the path to safety because your life depends on it. So we need that belief that actually leads to salvation because belief alone doesn't save anybody. Never has, never will. It's belief that leads people to obey because faith without works is dead being alone. So this concept we're studying it's really one, it's just so logical, it's so simple and plain. But sadly, much of the religious world teaches that you are saved before you put in any action or before you've done anything. Right? It's, it's like teaching that the people were saved from the fire that night before they got up out of their chairs. Was anybody saved before they got up out of their chairs in that illustration? No. It was only those who believed, got up, and left. Then they were saved. 
We understand that Scripture pictures Jesus standing up and giving a warning to the whole world. Jesus says, there's a fire coming. And here's what you need to do to be saved from it. Here's the plan, okay? We know the plan very well. You need to hear the message of safety. If you don't hear the warning with the instructions, then you won't know how to respond to the danger. Number two, you need to believe it. You need to believe that I'm telling you the truth, the truth that I am the Son of God. I died to take away your sins. That's the only way you can make it to heaven. You have to believe that or else you can't go any further. Those who don't believe that, don't follow the rest of the steps, okay? But then after you believe it, well, what do I do now? Well, you need to repent of your sins. We know the plan of salvation. Required for salvation is the need to bring about a change of your thinking with regards to sin. Uh, you have to have a change of mind that is going to lead to a change of your life, a completely different lifestyle. It is a decision to turn from sin that says, I am not going to pursue a lifestyle of sin anymore. I'm going to go about my life from here on out. When I make this decision, I am going to try my hardest to stay away from sin. That's the commitment that it takes. And that decision is called repentance. Number four, Jesus says, you need to confess my name before men. The great confession. Matthew 10, verse 32, Jesus talks about the confession. You know, the eunuch from Acts chapter 8, uh, Acts chapter eight. he followed this step when he vocalized and uh, he said he believed in the Savior. In uh, Acts chapter 8, and verse 37, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Therefore, what? I'll, I'll do whatever he tells me to do. Then they went down into the water, of course. So there was an acknowledgement of trust in the Savior and a lack of shame for everyone around him if whoever was traveling with him in the caravan or whatever. He didn't care. He vocalized it, said, I do believe. And then lastly, step number five, to tap into the first dose of forgiveness and salvation, you need to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Right? You've got to believe about baptism to do it. Right? So then Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, Ananias said, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, be immersed in water, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Point number six, from there you rise up out of the water, wash from your previous sins, all your previous sins, ready to live a new life, You've tapped into the blood, and now what you have to do is this condition. You've got to live faithfully until death as you strive for the crown of life. So there is a condition, and we focus on that all the time because that's where we're at. We've got to live faithfully. We've got to keep the blood. So here's the plan. You have to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and then once you're in the realm of safety, just live there. Live faithfully. So that's the path to safety. Right. So here Jesus is, uh, standing up before all mankind, giving this warning in these directions on how to be saved, how to stay saved. And he's saying, here's what you got to do to go to heaven. Here's the path to safety. And yet, what does the world do? They keep finding ways to get around, actually following that plan to get to heaven. And that's a simple plan, isn't it? They either try to rewrite it or they'll take parts of it out and say, that's not important. One of the biggest ones that I can think of is the false doctrine of belief only salvation. And that's really the doctrine that this uh, message today is geared towards. They say, well, the Bible says in order to go to heaven, you've got to believe in Jesus. Does the Bible say that? Yeah got to believe in Jesus to go to heaven. So they'll say that that means you simply need to believe in your heart that Jesus is the Savior and you'll be saved. Right? A lot of them say once saved, always saved. You just believe in God and in and, and, and Jesus. You can do whatever you want the rest of your life. That's all you have to do. The mere thought will save. But the Bible doesn't teach it. That's not the concept we've been studying. When the Bible says that a soul needs to believe in Jesus, what it means is that you need to believe that Jesus is telling the truth, believe he is who he says he is, but then what is implied is that you need to follow what he's telling you to do. 
right? Not only do you need to believe that he exists, but you need to believe his message and his plan. All right, so in our illustration, when the people of the Beverly Hills Country Club heard the warning of the fire, belief in the messenger would have resulted in following the instructions to safety. It is belief that leads to salvation. It is the same idea, and we use this illustration a lot, as putting your trust in the doctor. Right? Uh, you know, if you're sick with a disease of some sort and a doctor tells you, you just have to trust me. Okay, you got to put your trust in me. We logically understand that that implies that we're going to do whatever he tells us to do. All right, if he says, you trust me, take this certain kind of medicine, what are you going to do? You're going to take that certain kind of medicine. If he says, we're going to go through this treatment, then I'm going to go through that treatment. If I trust him, I'll do what he told me to do to be saved. That's the point. That's the logic. And it's so simple. Belief that leads to action. And to follow instruction. So I want to take you through some scriptures to the, for the rest of this lesson, probably the last third of it. And I want to show you how just, this makes so much sense when you look at the phrase, believing in Jesus. That is not just the mere mental ascent. It's, it's that he's implied here. You've got to believe, to trust, to follow Jesus. And that's the point. So you know, let's take a look at John 3.16. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So based on what we've been studying here, this would mean that a soul needs to believe Jesus, number one, not only that he is the Son of God, but also his plan of salvation. Everything attached to Jesus you need to believe in, not just the fact that he's the Son of God. Everything. And if you believe in Jesus and follow his instruction for salvation, do whatever he tells you to do to get there, you'll be saved. You just got to trust in Jesus. That's the point. Uh, let's go. I'm going to take you through a little tour of the book of Acts. The book of Acts uh, is sometimes called the book of conversion. And this book talks about the apostles and the early Christians preaching far and wide this message. And we read of several accounts of when they're going about preaching to believe in Jesus, what the people did and how it went down. Okay, so we can learn a lot from the book of Acts because that's how people and when people got saved. So first, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, of course, 3,000 souls believed on Jesus Christ for salvation. In verses 14 through 36 of that chapter, Peter preaches a sermon trying to convince his audience to believe on Jesus. His message is, the Old Testament prophesied about this. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. You can believe this message through these signs. Then you get to Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, and the people ask, okay, what do we do? Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, essentially, here's the plan. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness, the remission of your sins. So he told them how to follow the plan that Jesus had given. Verse 40 says, And with many other words he testified, and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. The King James Version says, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So he told them that they had a responsibility, something that they had to do to take the path to safety. So you know, he said, Jesus provided it. Nobody's going to do it for you, though. If you, you know, it's up to you to take that path. You choose salvation. Take it upon yourself, follow his plan. Get up out of your seat and get out, right? Verse 41, we see that that's exactly what 3,000 of them that day did. It says, then those who gladly received the word. Well, what's that imply? Those who believed the word. Oh, I believe what he's saying. Those who gladly received it were baptized. Just like Jesus' instructions said for the forgiveness of sins. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them, added to their number. So 3,000 souls believed, repented, they were baptized on the day of Pentecost. But, you know, listen to verse 44. It says, now all who, and this is a summary statement, by the way, it says, now all who believed were together and had all things in common. 
Did you hear what scripture calls those who just follow the plan? What are they called? Believers. Those who had believed were together and had all things in common. So for them to believe was an action verb indicating obedience to the entire set of instructions. They believed the plan and they followed it. So if you keep studying this throughout the book of Acts, you see many more people being taught the same thing. Right? They didn't give different plans to different people. It's the same plan. And the implication is they followed the same plan all through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, uh, Peter preached again to a different crowd. And he gave the same invitation with these words. Uh, he said, hey, here's what you need to do. Repent, therefore, and be converted. That means repent, have a change of mind, and be changed so that your sins may be blotted out. So he says, there's something you've got to do. You've got to follow the plan. And he summarized it with these words. So he was inviting them to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized in response to Jesus' instructions. Now, of course, Peter focused on the repentance part heavily here uh, in this verse, but that does not mean that he didn't also inform them about the rest of the plan of salvation. When he focuses, says, you need to change your mind about sin. Does that mean he left out the other steps? No. So Peter was going around preaching the same plan to every group, and they are all saved the same way. And he says, here's what you have to do to be saved. Uh, Acts chapter 5 and verse 14 says, as they continued to preach about this salvation, it says believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. So what that means is that more and more people were hearing the plan. Some of them believed it and they followed it. More believers were made. Verse 42 of chapter 5 says, and daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So they're just giving the invitation out to everybody. If you'll do this, you'll be saved. In Acts chapter 7, now we read about Stephen sounding the warning to which he was beaten and killed because the crowd didn't like his message that day. It always depends on the crowd, doesn't it? Sometimes the crowd responds to the warning. Sometimes the crowd doesn't respond to the warning, but the truth doesn't matter. All right, I guess I shouldn't say it that way. The truth doesn't uh, care. It's still the truth whether a thousand people believe or two people believe. In Acts chapter 8, Philip went and he preached to the people of Samaria, where many of them followed Jesus' plan. Verse 12 says, When they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. So they followed the plan. They believed it. They followed it. And this means they believed in Jesus. Later in that chapter, we read about Philip preaching the same plan to the eunuch on the road. Verse 35 says, Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And by the way, the eunuch is the one who initiated this question. He said, well, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, how, why do you ask that? Because he just preached Jesus unto him. And Jesus implies his plan about hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. So verse 37, he says, well, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he immersed him. He baptized him. And that's when the rejoicing took place. Acts chapter 9 and verse 18. After Ananias came and preached to Paul, it says that he too arose and was baptized in response to the gospel. We later read that Ananias told Paul that it was for the purpose of washing away his sins, Acts 22 and verse 16. Acts chapter 10, the gospel plan started being preached to the Gentiles. And Peter said in verse 47, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Right? We gotta, we gotta take, if they're going to believe, we can put them through the plan. If we jump quickly to Acts chapter 16, you'll read about Paul and Silas in prison when they got to preach to the Philippian jailer. And uh, verse 30, the jailer asked them plainly, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
Now listen carefully to how Paul and Silas respond to this. Here's how they answer. What do I have to do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your house. What's that mean? It means trust the Savior, follow his plan. So believe on Jesus, trust him. Now listen to verse 32, because don't stop there. It says, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him. And to all who were in his house, they sat them down, they teach the whole truth. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Verse 34 says, Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. So notice the wording. The jailer was only called a believer. When? When? after he obeyed the full gospel with his household. It wasn't until after the fact that it could be said that he and his household had believed in God. So believing in the Lord implies action. Uh, It's not just a thought in your heart. And they all heard the truth about Jesus. They believed it. They repented. They confessed. And they were baptized. One more in the book of Acts. Acts 18 and verse 8 uses the same wording. It says, Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. They all followed the plan. Same plan. So what does it mean to believe on the Lord? It means to trust him enough to follow his plan. So when we see that phrase throughout the New Testament, obedience is always implied when someone's a believer. When someone says, believe in Jesus, you've got to obey Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, Paul says to Timothy, So Timothy, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers. What does that mean? It means be an example to the Christians. Those who heard God's word, who trusted it and repented of their sins, confessed and were baptized. And it's so simple. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul references back to the time when Christians had obeyed the gospel for the first time. He says, in him, remember when you trusted in him, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That is, after you followed the plan, you had fully believed the truth, you were believers, you were Christians, you were sealed because you believed. So that is our study today. Um, Hopefully we understand that language a little bit more about believers and salvation that comes to believing on Jesus. It's not just the mere mental assent of, oh yeah, I think it's right. It's belief that leads to salvation. So those who are called true believers are only those who will obey. It is not uh, just those who believe in their heart. I think a good verse to close on. Remember the admonition in Romans chapter 10, verse 11. The Bible says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. If you trust Jesus' way to safety, you will be so happy in the end that that's what you did. People in the fire that night who got out, they could say with relief, I'm so glad that I believed the message. So that is our lesson for today. If you've not believed and obeyed that message, it's very simple. We've talked about it several times. You have to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And our faithfulness needs to be a constant. uh, We need to consistently remember to be faithful uh, and consider it and think about the things that we're doing in our Christian life to make sure we're being faithful. Otherwise, we forfeit that blood because we have to walk in the light. Uh, 1 John 1 talks about So if anyone needs to come forward for repentance or prayers or to obey the gospel, please come while we stand and sing. In my soul was the-